All right, today we're going to talk about The Dandelion Dynasty by Ken Liu. If you should read it, what are things that you might like about it? What are things that maybe would make you wary? How long should you give it? You know, all of those things, because even though I love this series, I'll just tell you that from the get-go, I think it's one of the best crafted things I have ever read. It's not going to be for everyone. Not everyone wants to go down this thought experiment rabbit hole. Not everyone has the time to read the 4,000 pages that exist within this. I mean, maybe it's a little less than 4,000, but even if you're looking at just page count, you open the book, the font is small. It's a big commitment. Like, these are not tiny books. So is it the right thing for you to try out? And then if you're going to try it out, I think expectation games, setting though appropriately, is going to set you up for success. So that's what we're going to attempt to do in this video. And just like all my should you reads... We'll just have it be completely spoiler-free, same in the comments, there will be no spoilers in any of this video. Now, I always like to start my review videos with how I read it, because I do think that can to tell you something about the reading experience. I don't know, we always come with our own baggage to books. So here is me with my baggage to this series <laughs> when I read it, that for sure affected my rating and my experience of the series. I read the first book, Grace of Kings, last summer. It was in the middle of me moving, I had just gotten really sick. It was a rough time. I still really enjoyed the book, but I definitely felt so tired and I could tell reading this series while emotionally and mentally drained was not really the right headspace. But I was buddy reading it with my friend Jocelyn and I powered through and it took me way longer than I think it normally would because the first book is actually the shortest one. I think it's like only 500 or 600 pages, but it took me like a month and a half to read The Grace of Kings. Now that said, I still really enjoyed it. Um, at that time I had read Ken Liu's short story collections. So his writing style, his way of framing thought experiments, I was already really set up for and I enjoy how he does that. I'm just already predisposed for that. But it took me a really long time to then pick up the sequel. It just kept getting punted down the line until this spring, I finally picked up The Wall of Storms, one of the best books that I've read, period. End of story, amazing book. <laughs> Got me so excited. And then I decided to ask Ken Liu to be on my channel. I have an interview with him that is mar largely spoiler free, but I do mark in the description where we might be going into things that people who are spoiler sensitive want to, you know, not listen to. So you can make your own decisions there. But I decided to ask him to be on my channel. And he said yes, which was wonderful. And then I was like, I guess I should finish the rest of the Dandelion Dynasty. So if you don't know, the third and fourth book are actually kind of one book split down the middle for the sake of publishing, because you cannot publish a 2,000 page book. It's just not possible. <laughs> and so I basically read them as one book over the course of about five or six weeks. So I went from, you know, reading the prequel-ish book, spending nine months not touching it, the series, and then I marathon the last 3,000 pages within probably two and a half months. Do I recommend that to everyone? I don't know. Being so immersed in the world was lovely, but it's also kind of a draining experience because it is there's a lot of words. There's just a lot of words and a lot of things going on. But that said, it's one of those things that keeps sticking with me. Even if I could point out where there's imperfect pacing for my tastes, I think about the thought experiment. I think of how things were set up and like how things paid off and what emotional beats worked because of a thing that was done earlier. And it's just masterful for me. I can't think of a lot of things that are like it. And for that reason, I do think most people should at least attempt it to see if it's maybe your cup of tea, because I don't think you're really going to know unless you give it a shot. So that's my experience. My rating, it, it's not technically a five star for every book, but the sum, it's a five star. It's masterful. I'm going to be rereading it. I'm going to be shouting about it for the rest of the year. I love it so much. Now, what is the project of this book? Because like I kind of said, expectation games, it's kind of a big deal. Especially, you know, if you want to try it out, it's a lot of, it's a lot of work. So The Grace of Kings itself is kind of a prequel to the other three books, which like I said, are kind of two books with the third book split in, in half. And so The Grace of Kings, if you read and like that, you might be jarred because then you're going to pick up The Wall of Storms and it's a different project. Because the whole idea and goal of this is taking a community, a civilization, that is right on the edge of going into the modern era, right on the edge of technological advances, societal advances, everything like that, and the transition state into that mode. And we see most of that transition in Wall of Storms on, but Grace of Kings kind of sets up this more like historical fantasy of, well, here's where we are, here are the players, and then by the end of Grace of Kings, we have set up, and now we are going to transition from this pre-modern to modern era with you know, lots of cool technology and it's a fantastical world and there are gods and, you know, it has a lot of trappings of fantastical fiction. But at its core, 
that's its thought experiment. And so because of that, it's hyper focused on world building that is centered around civilizations and cultures. And a lot of it's inspired by but subverting what we have done in our own history. And that that's the thought experiment. And I got very excited to finish this series after hearing Ken Liu talk about it at an author signing event, because I'm like, oh, that is a fascinating thing to look at because I don't think you get to look at that idea very often. And that is a thing that I love about reading Ken Liu's short stories and the Dandelion Dynasty is he chooses to ask questions and answer them that I am always asking myself. The how did we get here as society question and how could we have gotten here differently is always rolling around in my brain. So to have a answer, not the answer, but an answer to that question, phenomenal for me personally. Now, there's also this whole genre question. <laughs> And we actually do have like a few minutes discussion of this in the interview. What genre is the Dandelion Dynasty? How do I pitch this to the right group of people? Because it's like historical fantasy for one book. And then it's kind of sort of silk punk sci historical fantasy for the other three books. And I think what you, what, what you'll be able to figure out fairly early on, if you read Grace of Kings and you're like, this was a good book. I didn't love it, but it was like a good time. If you read Wall of Storms, and if you get through the first arc of it, that first part, you'll know by then if this is the series that is going to capture your imagination and make you really excited about what's to come. That That's what I would say, and you'll get a good taste of what this series has to offer within that period of time, which is, you know, only like 800 pages, you know? You can spend 800 pages figuring out, is this the thought experiment writing style execution for me? So that's what I would kind of say there, because genre-wise, it's an epic. It's looking at societal changes. It's doing a lot of things I'm used to seeing in deductive science fiction books. But I don't know if the average science fiction reader would really like this because it also doesn't have the trappings of the sci-fi genre. It's a story about engineers. It's a story about engineers on a mechanical sense. It's a story about engineers and society making new forms of government. It's about solving problems. And it's truly about watching the land of Dara, the people of Dara, and how they go from pre-modern to modern era. And I don't know how to classify that, and it's it's really interesting, and that's a thing that I love about it. But I think can be it's, it can be difficult because if you don't have the right expectations and you think, oh, this is going to be a historical fantasy for four books, well, it's not. And if you think it's going to have all this cool engineering, well, it will, and only some of it shows up in the first book, you know. So just just know that that's some of the baggage it comes with. But I feel like it's it's it makes so much sense once you see the whole picture. Now. The writing. I think the writing wor will work for a lot of people. I think in general, on a sentence to sentence level, the sentences are simple. They're relatable. The character work comes through well, but it's fairly dense. And I think sometimes things are done in a fragmented way that people are not used to. And I, I do think some of that might come from Ken Liu's first writing being in short stories, but chapters really are complete thoughts. And within those chapters, you're going to jump around into different perspectives. It's not as jarring if you've read like Malazan by Steven Erickson or anything like that. Like you'll know whose head you are in and everyone does have distinct thoughts. But one thing I will say is it does have technical jargon. And in that way, it can become dense at times when we're really getting into the nitty gritty of how we solved a problem. Um, there's a lot of geeking out for me in those moments, but also I could see it easily not being as fun, especially if you maybe don't have the technical background to see what Ken Liu's doing as he's creating these machines that are inspired by stuff in our own world. So that's something I think to know going in. And also the story narrative framing, I've already kind of told you, you know, Grace of Kings is a prequel and everything like that. But in general, there's inconsistent pacing. There are going to be moments that you're like, oh my gosh, I can't put this down. We're just going, going, going. And then there's going to be moments where you're like, wait, we're really having a cooking competition for like, you know, 300 pages. And yes, <laughs> yes, you are. <laughs> so, and everything makes sense. And it really, I think, it really brings people to life for me because um, you're getting to really see them in these quiet moments, but that doesn't mean it's going to be great for everyone. And it doesn't necessarily mean that just because it works for me that I think it's like an outstanding pro. Sometimes people have the right to want the plot to move along a little bit faster. And I do think there is an indulgence to this series that I love because I want to indulgently be thinking about these things and be in this space. 
but there's a lot of spent time spent in the quiet moments. And there are a lot of characters that you'll be introduced to later on. And you're like, what? We already have so many characters. How am I getting one other character getting their background story in another chapter? But it's always so worth it. And I just love how Ken Liu introduces characters. Ken Liu can introduce a character and I am instantly invested in them. Hands down. The start of the third book, we get a new character. And I was all in. The first part of the third book is just introducing a new character. Phenomenal. Loved it. Um, I don't think everyone would love that. And that's another thing that's not traditional about the Dandelion Dynasty is there are main characters, but it's not the same when you're, as you're reading like other epic fantasy. It's not like when you're reading Stormlight Archive and you're like Kaladin, all in on Kaladin. There's not an equivalence there. There are people you're following. There are story arcs you're really invested in, but at its core, it's about the people. And so you have people that you're looking at that, you know, show you how bigger game pieces are moving. They definitely have their own fulfilling arcs. You know, there are moments you will be happy, sad, excited for characters. Like, that will still happen, but it's not the same as what you're used to in a traditional fantasy book. Like, I had to get used to very early on not being able to be like, oh, this is my main character and now I will follow their journey. It's like, no, you are ish, but also there's going to be a lot of zooming out and zooming in and you're going to maybe not zooming in where that character is. You're zooming in somewhere else. <laughs> and I think that's important to know for expectations. That said, there are some minor characters that are some of my favorite of all time. They only get like 80 pages in the book. and I'm just like, I love you. And then there are characters I hate with my entire being. So you're going to have emotional responses and the characters are so well grounded. Like there's a character who does something in this book and I'm just like, I hate that you did that. I don't like it. I just, ah, you were so close. But it, it made sense. And I mean, that's a huge theme of this series is what is nature? What can be changed? And do people only do things within their nature? Like the word nature is used a lot. <laughs> I will give it that. Like there are a lot of themes being explored. And one of them is definitely the nature of a person. How much of that is innate? How much of that is changeable? and stuff like that. And you really do feel that as you're looking at characters and you desperately want them to make a different decision than they do. You really do, but you also know, like, we have spent so much time really showing us who this character actually is. And like, I have to admit, this does make sense. I just hate it. I just hate it. <laughs> and oh, it's discussions on morality. What does it mean to belong? How do we solve problems? How do we move on from catastrophes as a civilization? This, this, this book has so many of those things that I love to unpack, I love to explore. And so if none of these are like complete turnoffs for you, because it's not traditional, it is long, it does require a lot of your time and energy, like I don't think this is a breezy book, at least for me, I always had to be in a reading mood. This series didn't put me in a reading mood. I had to come in a reading mood and wanting to engage with the material. It's not like I had to take notes. It's not like I had to do anything like that, but I just had to be awake. <laughs> and I'm not always awake, and sometimes some books wake me up. And for me, this series wasn't that, but oh, I love it. And after I finished it, I just, like, spent the rest of my evening looking at Ken Liu interviews and just wanting to be in that world, because I was just like, what do I do now? I'm not in Dara anymore. <laughs> so I love it. I think it's really solid, especially if this is the type of stuff you love about fantasy, exploring these questions, seeing what might be different answers, because that is a thing I also really appreciate. There's a lot of inspiration from our own world. Like, there are content warnings for horrible, graphic, atrocious war crimes, okay? Like, I would look those up if any of those things are things you don't want to experience or you need to know maybe when to glaze over a chapter. Um, harrowing things. So there's a lot of things that are inspired by our own world history. But at the same time, when given the choice, Ken Liu does choose to think of alternative answers and follow through that thought experiment in ways that I felt really fulfilling and kind of hopeful-ish. I mean, it's still a very grounded thought experiment, so there are consequences and not everything's happy, but it's not grimdark. Like, I, I wouldn't say that it's devoid of hope. It just really has low moments. Like it's highs are highs and it's lows are lows. And I think that's realistic. And it's just such a fantastically grounded thing that hopefully this is at all coherent. I just really love it. And I'm hoping that I can help it continue to find its audience because I think for the right reader, this is one of the best things you will ever consume. Like it's not gonna be the best for everyone. I do think it does have some 
non-traditional ways of storytelling. And then sometimes there are things that I think, oh, we're doing this pattern of narrative structure again. I won't mention it because I don't want you to suddenly just see it everywhere. But, you know, there's certain, you know, habits that Ken Liu has in his writing when he writes this series. And it's like, oh, okay, we're going to go through this formula again. And so none of that is quote unquote perfection. But at the same time, I love it. I love it a lot. And I hope you give it a shot. Let me know if you've read the series, what else you would recommend to people who are looking into it spoiler free. Put those in the comments down below. If you still cur curious about it, still have questions, feel free to leave those in the comments and I'll answer that. And if you just want to let me know you're here, oh, I don't know. Leave an emoji of a turtle. Yes, I want a turtle emoji. And otherwise, like if you liked it, subscribe if you want to, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye. Thank you.